Okay, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone. This is um, Arika Virapongsi um, from Middle Path Eco Solutions, and I'm also coordinating ESIP's webinar series. And I'd like to welcome everybody to the ESIP webinar series. It's entitled The Socioeconomic Value of Earth Science Data Information Applications. Um, in case this, you're new to ESIP, um, I want to point out that ESIP's mission is to support networking and data dissemination needs by linking the functional sectors of observation, research, application, and education of earth science. Um, and in support of their mission, each year ESIP highlights one of their strategic goals. And this year's highlight is on promoting techniques to articulate and measure the socioeconomic value and, and benefit of earth science data information application. So this webinar series is one activity towards this goal. Um, next. So if you've been participating in our series so far, you would have noticed that the first few webinars we've had so far have been focused on um, providing an overall context to the meaning of socioeconomic value of earth science data, while the last half of the series focuses on more specific case studies which are being provided by ESIPS clusters. Um, the, the YouTube, if you've missed some of these uh, webinars, there's uh, the YouTube, uh, ESIP YouTube, as well as the um, fig share where you can find some of these webinars and um, I'll be I'll upload that in a chat in just a second and um, for today's webinar um, we're pleased to have the disaster life cycle cluster with us and with that I'd like to turn it over to Karen Mo who is the co-chair of the cluster along with Dave Jones who will also be presenting in this webinar thank you Erica Erica um, I'm really happy that uh, we had this opportunity to kind of highlight some of the work that our cluster has been involved in over the, the past couple of years in particular. Uh, with uh, Dave Jones, we've led a group that's been pretty active in uh, developing a test bed for uh, evaluating a, a common operating picture for disasters data uh, that has uh, eventually um, morphed into the uh, the dashboard that you'll be hearing about later. Uh, we've also established, uh, with with the help of the All Hazards Consortium, uh, the idea of uh, a um, data driven uh, decision making or 3DM workshops to really focus on uh, the role of data for for disasters in particular. And we're currently very active in uh, identifying operational readiness levels and dealing with uh, describing trusted data for the uh, user community. So today we're going to be sharing our insights and working with uh, two of our partner groups, the, the All Hazards Consortium, which uh, has been focusing on, on hurricanes and power restoration, and the uh, California Earthquake Clearinghouse, and uh, the work on um, getting uh, new data products for earthquakes and wildfires. So those are our, our topics today. Uh, the ESIP community really brings a lot of technical expertise and knowledge about uh, new data products, but we rely heavily on our partnerships with um, the emergency management groups because they're the community that can tell us how to use the data and, and the, the whole question of usability is critical to the idea of trusted data that we're working so hard on. So with that, I'd, I'd like to introduce uh, our first speaker, Tom Moran. Tom is the Executive Director of the All Hazards Consortium and uh, he and his group, uh, which includes a couple of uh, participants from ESIP, uh, has been focusing on assisting really the state and local governments to work with the uh, private sector and uh, the operators of critical infrastructure. Uh, and the focus has really been on regional planning, education, and uh, specific projects to, uh, as he'll declare, solve problems quickly. Uh, they've come up with the sensitive information sharing environment and uh, it's been really critical to uh, promoting the use of, of more uh, data to help solve problems. And Tom is a, a really talented facilitator. He, he makes it really easy for people to um, see how their uh, role in sharing their in understanding of problems and solutions uh, as a group 
uh, really make some connections to make the job get done better. So with that, let me turn it over to Tom. Great. Thank you, Karen. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Just fine. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you, Karen, for the kind words. We're really, really happy to be supporting and partnering with ESIP. Uh, was not aware of ESIP. Uh, my background uh, is in the private sector. I came out of the telecom space, retired in 2003, and started working with states uh, as they were looking at working these multi-state disasters uh, in 2005. Over the years, it's matured, and the consortium now, uh, let's go to our first slide, Dave. The consortium now represents about 45,000 stakeholders um, uh, across the United States, across multiple sectors. So uh, this slide basically is when a disaster strikes of any kind, most of these affect multiple states. Some are local. Uh, many of them move, like uh, hurricane storms, things like that. And as they move, they go across state lines. And, and unfortunately, um, <clears throat> these disasters don't respect, you know, the boundary lines of federal agencies and states and private sector. And um, Dave, tap on your uh, uh, advance. This there you go. So when these things hit, you basically light up federal, state agencies on the left and private sector folks on the right. They all have their own systems and processes. They all work together to try to put out whatever the the issues are. And in, in the fog of chaos, it's it's really information is king. Not just the quantity, but less less so quantity, but more reliability. And can we validate this information? And can we is it is it ready for operational use? So um, the consortium really focuses on linking the infrastructure owner operators from electric, fuel, communication, so forth, with the states that are both impacted by the event or that play a role as fleets move across the country towards Florida or North Carolina in the recent hurricanes or that may be moving to California for the current wildfires. So there are states that have a direct role because they're impacted by the event and there are states that have an indirect role that are having trucks, fleets and utilities and so forth moving through their states that get um, you know, slow down or have to stop along the way for various things and is trying to basically speed up the process of information flow. So uh, let's go to our next slide. So the best use case that that um, that founded this this whole concept of we need better data and we need to move towards data driven decision making started during Hurricane Sandy. Sandy hit Hurricane massive historic outages. We've had several historic storms since then with <clears throat> Harvey, Irma, Maria, and um, Michael and, and Florence. So basically in the electric sector, I'll just zero in on one, they had over 70,000 resources moving from across the United States. They had to come across all these state borders and Canada to get into the two or three impacted states. Um, we had 40 states to coordinate with. Delays occur at so many different places. First of all, every every way station uh, who's not aware these fleets are coming, the trucks have to stop and you can add a day or two to the delivery time. Uh, there was really no mechanism at that time to share sensitive information because the, the sensitive information is my trucks are here. Private sector doesn't want that information out there for a lot of security reasons. Gangs track these fleets, steal the copper, um, rob the drivers. Um, they sometimes have to carry a lot of cash going through toll gates. So they don't want people to know where those fleets are because of that reason. So there's a lot of issues preventing um, the information sharing that needs to go on. But following that, the consortium worked with the private sector and states, and we developed some very quick turnaround solutions. But the private sector, after Sandy came to the, came to the consortium board and said, hey, we'd like to start a working group. We'd like to do it under the All Hazards Consortium because being under a current State guided 501c3 uh, gave them a certain safety and the ability for you know um, to, to plan with states in a safe environment. So they formed the multi-state fleet response working group, separately chartered group under the All Hazards Consortium, and they started working problems. And so they the fleet work group basically sustains year-round planning meetings that address specific problems. Once they know the problem, they design a use case around it. The use case then provides the foundation to build merged data into solutions. So through that process, Dave Jones, uh, 
came, started participating with the Fleet Response Working Group um, and brought to their attention the ESIP partnership. So let's go to our next slide, Dave. The ESIP partnership was really a wonderful discovery for the private sector because it allowed them to basically have an organization that. have an organization they could partner with that would help them find data sets and test them and operationalize them. And one of the things we learned along the way, there was plenty of data. Well, what the private sector wanted is, okay, can we put something together that will allow us to know what data is operationally ready and what data is going to take some more time and investment? Well, Karen Mo uh, basically introduced the Fleet Working Group to the NASA ORL, or Operational Readiness Level Standard. It was uh, customized for the private sector. And as in use today, you're going to hear Kerry Hicks from Duke talk about that. And that basically improved the confidence in data sets in the minds of decision makers. So they spent less time validating the data and more time making decisions. So this has been a wonderful partnership. Uh, through feedback from the private sector, the dashboard was created that uh, Dave Jones is gonna talk about. It's been updated. It has grown to be a standard tool now and has been part of the solution that's basically eliminated uh, about 70% of the delays that were occurring during Sandy, they don't exist anymore, which means utility crews coming across the country can arrive 24 to 48 hours earlier because they don't have the delays uh, because of the dashboard or the data we're able to move quickly. So let's go to our last slide, Dave. So the future here, as we go forward, our partnership with ESIP, we're gonna continue to develop. We're looking to build a GIS focused working group of utility GIS personnel. Carrie and I are working on that. We're very excited about it. And take this ORL standard farther uh, in the operational world, but really leverage our partnership with ESIP, which has been a marvelous partnership. Uh, I think we've just scratched the surface. So I'm really glad to be supporting this uh, effort, and we look forward to a long and uh, prosperous relationship between the two organizations. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I will say if anybody does have uh, questions or comments, we'll have time at the end for that, uh, but feel free to go ahead and post uh, any comments uh, in the chat box as we go along. Uh, so with that uh, introduction, I think we move on to our next uh, speaker, Dave Jones. Uh, Dave is the CEO of Storm Center Communications, and he's been, uh, he has experience as a um, meteorologist, uh, on-air broadcaster for television, and has really focused on improving the communication of uh, climate and weather to meteorologists. Uh, he has very successfully leveraged the NASA and NOAA in, uh, investments in the Small Business Innovative Research, SBIR program, uh, developed, to develop this um, secure and controlled data sharing environment that uh, he's going to be talking about next. Dave? Thanks, Karen. I appreciate the introduction, and uh, I'll dive right into this. Um, this is really an exciting webinar, and it's 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 great to see um, ESIP, uh, all the work that everybody's done within the ESIP community come together to really focus in on uh, actual use cases and industries and organizations that can benefit from earth science data and pulling that together in real time. So. Uh, one of the things that, that we had developed, as Karen mentioned, under the SBIR program, Small Business Innovation Research, was the ability to um, address a, a grand challenge that the federal government had, and that challenge was how do agencies access and share uh, geospatial data, or any data for that matter, um, uh, between agencies, and maybe between agencies and the um, private sector or agencies and, and state agencies and organizations or county, uh, so they can improve their situation awareness and decision making. And when we first started this out, the answer was pretty easy. Agencies access data, but they didn't share. And so uh, we developed a GeoCollaborate at Storm Center to uh, put people on the same map at the same time so they can improve their situational awareness and decision making. So in the upper left hand corner of the screen, you have a leader. So if you have credentials, um, you can access disparate data sets from any agency, uh, organization, NGO, um, any private sector company that offers these web services and pull them together and share them to uh, followers, 
and the followers on the right-hand side can be connected anywhere in the world on any device, and they can get the same data as well. And at the bottom, uh, there's a collaborative dashboard. And that dashboard has proved really valuable within the All Hazards Consortium and the Fleet Response Working Group, um, particularly in the sensitive information sharing environment community, where um, data can be shared, uh, but no one takes possession of that data. So you're using it for improved situational awareness. You're using it for decision making, but you can't download and save it uh, unless the data curator wants to enable you to do that. And that's really opened up a lot of doors within the sharing between uh, government and private sector organizations. So, so how does it work? Um, I spent some time to put this uh, little visualization together to show you, and I'm using the, the state of Pennsylvania, let's say, as an example. Um, if the state of Pennsylvania had uh, an instance of GeoCollaborate, which they do, um, they could pull up data sets and they could connect with any private sector organization within Pennsylvania if they wanted to. Now, the intermediary between uh, a point-to-point -point connection, which is uh, what GeoCollaborate does not do, is the cloud. So you have a trusted cloud environment. So if Pennsylvania wants to share their data, it goes into, currently we're using Amazon EC2, uh, goes into that environment, and then any of these organizations that have GeoCollaborate turned on will receive Pennsylvania's data and any information that they want to share. And of course, these other organizations, Giant, Hershey, a Garden Center, a Tire Center, and Walmart, once they connect and turn GeoCollaborate on, then they can also get the exact same data in their environment, so on their map, uh, so they could put on their own uh, sensitive information uh, that they might not want to share out. And consequently, if any of these organizations had information that they wanted to share into the collaboration session, let's say on the upper right-hand side, CNS uh, Corporation has fuel outage locations. Those dots you see in Maryland and Virginia uh, represent fuel locations that are closed because of power outages or they're just unable to pump fuel. Well, that information is really important for utility crews that are passing through the state or responding and uh, they don't want to set up shop uh, around a bunch of closed gas stations because they need fuel themselves. And then the one right below them, HPS, might be a property management firm. Well, they might want to highlight counties where they have big properties that need addressing or, or needs, they need some help with, uh, or they're looking for some status. And then on the lower left-hand side, there may be a utility out there that has transmission and distribution lines that they want to put into the picture so they can describe to a state agency what lines they're working on and which ones they're having uh, issues with that they need to restore power. So CNS and HPS and uh, the utilities can share their data into the trusted cloud environment. And then the state of Pennsylvania could pull that information right into their collaborative common operating picture. So they're seeing disparate data sources brought together so uh, in one common operating picture, and I'll just put it full screen here just so you can see what it, what it looks like. And that full screen shows the distribution uh, uh, lines, power lines in there that the power company has shared, where the fuel is out coming from a different source, and also um, some highlighted counties in blue where this property management company is seeing some major issues and they need some assistance. So, uh, or some feedback or, or whatever. So that's kind of how GeoCollaborate works. You can have a leader that shares data out to multiple followers, and then you can have others with separate instances of GeoCollaborate that want to stage data to share back in uh, to other instances, or they just want to follow and uh, improve their situational awareness. So it's, uh, it's a very flexible capability that has not existed before, which is why the SBIR program within the federal government actually funded it, because it had to be a new invention. There couldn't have been any other technology in existence out there that enabled you to do this. So um, it's really a federal government's program to invest in high-risk investments, uh, something that capital, venture capital firms would not invest in, uh, but the government will. And so here's an example of a private sector instance, say Acme Recycling there circled in the yellow in the upper left-hand side, um, having a drop-down menu because they may have a data sharing agreement 
with Pennsylvania or with other companies or with other nonprofit organizations that have information that could be helpful to keeping their business going in times of disaster could do a drop down menu and say, I want to pull in the Pennsylvania Business Emergency Operations Center's data layers that they're staging and then it would come right into Acme Recycling's instance. And then Acme Recycling could add their own critical infrastructure information uh, that they need to get their business back to business, to um, keep the economy rolling in Pennsylvania, and to keep uh, business operating. So these are uh, some examples I just wanted to go through pretty quickly to show some of the past events uh, that we activated GeoCollaborate within the All Hazards Consortium for the movement of fleet utility vehicles throughout the country. And you heard Tom mention before that, you know, there are some states there that are that are what we call pass-through states. Well, those are these green states. When uh, Hurricane Florence made landfall in the Carolinas, uh, we lit up all these different states. As a state uh, governor declared a state of emergency, then the, the state lit up red. And uh, the Federal Motor Carrier Services Administration uh, Transportation uh, issued waivers up and down the East Coast for certain trucks that were uh, had waivers. They could operate a little bit longer uh, or, um, or uh, operate half full or, or empty to get to one place or another. Those are the purple states. And then the green states are pass-through states. These are states that were helping utility crews get through their state rapidly so they could get into the disaster area. So it's really pretty amazing when you think of a hurricane hitting, you, you pretty much hear about people evacuating on the news and, and, you know, preparations being made. But there are all sorts of impacts to infrastructure and uh, a utility sector that are gearing up, and they have to gear up many, many days before uh, landfall happens. This is an example of uh, clicking on the state of Virginia. So a pop-up menu uh, comes up, and you can see the state of emergency declaration, transportation waiver, and the Federal Motor Carrier Services Administration regional transportation waiver. And these are PDF documents. So if you click on one, you can see the actual uh, waiver for carriers transporting essential relief supplies. Uh, you can see the actual executive order for the declaration of a state of emergency. These are PDF documents that don't have geographical coordinates assigned to them. But within GeoCollaborate, you can make those PDF documents available in a geospatial context so you can access them. Why is this helpful? Uh, it helps all these, these uh, carriers that are really um, going to uh, move from one state to another. Uh, they don't have to print out these documents and keep them in their cabs you know, and, and, and spill coffee on them and have them blow everywhere when they have to open the window or do whatever. They can now just open up their iPad or their phone, their mobile device, click on the state and access these uh, individual waivers. Uh, so in case they get pulled over or uh, they, they're in an accident, they can show the law enforcement why they're where they are, they're responding to this disaster, and they have these uh, waivers in front of them. There's also a key points window in the upper left-hand point there that any sort of information can be added so anybody can pull up on the dashboard uh, when they're responding to these disasters. Um, some uh, some meteorological information that's kind of cool and geeky, uh, at least for, for me and other meteorologists, we can pull in real-time NOAA satellite imagery. This is for Hurricane Florence, and uh, the Hurricane Center produces a uh, geospatial product to identify this, the 34 knot wind radius, the 50 knot wind radius, which is storm force winds and then hurricane force winds. And so we can overlay those automatically on the hurricane at the right time so you can see how far out the winds expand from the center of the storm. And then the watches, warnings, and advisories that are officially issued by the National Weather Service appear as well. And so um, these are just a couple of other products that seem to be um, pretty good. Uh, at least some of the feedback that we've gotten has been very good. And that is um, uh, forecast wind gusts, <clears throat> excuse me, that are put out by the National Weather Service. They can be pulled out in a geospatial format and uh, plotted in. And we're also uh, working with uh, NOAA Satellite Division, the Joint Polar Satellite uh, System Program, uh, to look at some innovative products. <coughs> Excuse me. How can we take satellite data and perhaps derive from that satellite in information where flooding is occurring? 
And these pixels that you see, these orange and red and yellow pixels, indicate that, you know, there's water there where it normally isn't. And uh, this is probably flooding. Well, where the arrow is pointing of to I-40 and up towards the top of the green, uh, the green uh, polygon that's been drawn there, uh, you can see the picture to the right. That's I-40, and it was certainly flooded, and uh, it's showing up in these pixels. So we're making some real great progress in uh, working with scientists uh, in uh, the JPSS program to pull out from satellite imagery um, information that could be very helpful to FEMA and others. And then the last slide that I have is I just wanted to give some kudos to the state of North Carolina because uh, they issued a state of emergency. You can see North Carolina lit up there in red seven days before the landfall of Hurricane Florence. And, you know, a lot of things had to come together for this. But, uh, you know, the National Hurricane Center and the Weather Service had phenomenal forecasts. It was amazing. I hope they get a medal for this uh, for Florence and also for Michael. But uh, the forecasts were accurate. But look at that. The state of North Carolina issued a state of emergency seven days ahead of time. And everybody could see this happening because they were connected to the dashboard and they were seeing the sharing of this sensitive information uh, through the All Hazards Consortium. And this is an example of All Hazards Consortium's dashboard um, lighting up during the storms. So uh, that's it for me and I'll throw it back to Karen and be happy to answer questions uh, towards the end. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Carrie Hicks. And Carrie is uh, a GIS analyst, senior GIS analyst at Duke Energy Corporation. She's been very busy this year with uh, major hurricanes on the East Coast. Uh, working with her uh, team as kind of the key um, information specialist for, for GIS type of data. Uh, she's been heavily involved in preparedness efforts within Duke and has a uh, geospatial peer team that uh, she works with during storm events. So uh, let me go ahead then and turn it over to, uh, to Carrie. Great, Karen, thank you. Um, Dave, if you wouldn't mind, uh, there we go. All right, so I'm gonna be talking a little bit about uh, something that you might have heard of before in other calls and webinars, um, and even during this one, which is the operational readiness levels and how we were able to sort of operationalize this model as a pilot during Hurricane Florence. So Dave, if you wouldn't mind, next slide. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit about what our goal was in this endeavor and kind of our, our motivation for doing this. And then I'm gonna be speaking about what operationalized ORLs look like in practice during a major storm event. And finally, I'm gonna be speaking on successes and lessons learned. So for a little bit of background, um, we have our, here at Duke Energy, we have a GIS analyst storm team. So over the last year and a half, we have really been working hard to kind of consolidate our team here at Duke Energy so that we can all leverage each other's skills and expertise to come together and help support um, restoration when there's a major storm event. So we do a lot of different things. We do data automation, map automation. We leverage our ESRI portal quite a bit. Um, we establish best practices and processes for us to follow leading up to and during a storm event. And that's kind of the work that the, our analyst storm team has done. And to give a bit of background on the operational readiness levels, this model has been worked on and refined over the past year. And we actually have an ORL committee within the SICE working group that has come together and kind of refined a lot of the model parameters, and we decided to test the model during a real storm event, and that's kind of the situation I'm going to be referring to. But we in implemented the ORLs within our ecosystem back in June. We, so we had a, a storm summit in Charlotte back in June of this year, and that's kind of when we came together. And we did a lot of different things, but one of them was figuring out how to implement the ORLs within our system. So speaking really quickly about the operational readiness level, some of you have seen this um, model before, but this just shows how you come about ranking a certain data set on the model. So you start at the top left corner there and you basically ask questions about the data and if you say no as an answer to the question, uh, you move down a level. So there are very few ORL1 data sets out there um, and that's by design. The 
the uh, criteria is very stringent, but um, as you move down there, you'll see, you know, if you get to the ORL three or four, you're really looking at more of a develop or test data set, not so much an operational data set. You can move on there, Dave. So speaking to the process for adding a new data set to a production application in storm mode. So first, you really need to find the data set. You know, where is it? Is it online? Did someone email it to you in an attachment? You know, um, we have to we have to find the data, and we really prefer that it be a REST service. So that's ArcGIS REST service. It's something that we can go out and grab really quickly as a URL and just plug and play into our application. Um, then we need to test or assess the source of the data set. Is it trusted and reliable? Um, if we're not sure, you know, we don't add it. Um, we have a test bed web map that we have in our system that we can add those kinds of data sets to, but if we're not sure of the source and whether or not it's reliable, we don't add that data to our application. Um, then we add the, the service as a portal item. So we have a special naming convention that we use. It starts with the ORL level, then the data source, so for example, NOAA, and then a, a description of the data set. So anytime we add those portal items, we make sure that we stick to that naming convention. Then we add tags within portal. So we tag the ORL level, the use case, and the incident command section that it's supposed to roll up through. Um, so within our incident command, we have four different sections. We have operations, uh, finance, admin, planning, and logistics. And generally speaking, an application or a data set is going to roll up to one of those depending on the use case. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. We then add a full description of the data set within Portal, and we share to our internal Portal storm group, and that's mostly just for tracking. We then add the Portal item to our web map. So we kind of look at it and make sure the service is working as expected. We set any necessary zoom level restrictions. We check the labels, symbology, et cetera. After we do that, we then add the REST service endpoint to our alert site dashboard for monitoring. So this is allowing us to monitor the performance um, and the run time of external services because within Portal, if the service is not, uh, if it's timing out or if it's slowing down, that can affect the performance of the entire application. So anytime we incorporate an external service, we're monitoring it constantly to make sure that it's not slowing down or timing out. And then lastly, we use flash pages in the application to communicate to the users that there's new data, or if we change something about the data, we use those flash pages to do that. So I mentioned the sections and the use cases. So this kind of illustrates what that means. So we have our four sections I mentioned. Um, underneath those sections, we have specific use cases. And those are use cases that we've defined internally as being particularly um, important and great opportunities for GIS to add value. Um, the situational awareness rolls up through planning, whereas routing, flooding, and base camp staging rolls up through logistics. And then finally, we have outages and grid monitoring that rolls up through operations. We don't actually have a use case identified for finance or admin. And um, just to mention really quickly, GIS rolls up through situational awareness. So, um, so this is kind of what it looks like on the back end in Portal. We have our Waze Alerts layer, and you can see it's labeled ORL4, Waze Alerts. Um, there's a description there, not very long, but it describes what the data set is. And then we have our tags. So it says ORL4, routing, logistics. We have our um, use case of routing. So this is a screenshot of the application itself. Um, you can see outages and restorations, that's operations. We have planning under situational awareness, and then logistics rolls up, uh, or flooding, routing, and base camps roll up to logistics. And then within the layer list, we have um, the external services labeled with the ORL levels. You can see there ORL3. Um, this is a screenshot of our alert site dashboard. So it shows kind of the response times of different services. You can see there at the top, um, one of the services had an HTTP error. Um, that was the National Weather Service hourly river flow anomaly forecast. So we actually ended up taking that service out of our application because it was causing issues with performance. So it's really great. It allows us to kind of um, monitor these services to make sure they're performing well. Go ahead, Dave. So some successes. Um, we found that implementing the operational readiness levels were really helpful in the GIS side of things. It fit really well into existing processes that we had, 
And going through the process of ranking it, let us kind of ask, you know, is this a data set that's appropriate to add to this application? Does it fit into this use case? Um, so yeah, like I say there in the third bullet point, we found that filling out the form before adding a data set made us more thoughtful and less knee-jerk about simply throwing data out there. Um, so I have an example there of the VIIRS flood data um, that was sent to me. You know, it passed many of the requirements to be ranked, but just because it was kind of a confusing data set to throw in last minute, we decided not to add it. And if we hadn't been going through the process of ranking it, we may not have come to that conclusion. And lessons learned. Um, so we continue to, to um, struggle with communication. So just uh, helping people understand what the ORL definitions are. Um, we're working on a platform right now that actually incorporates those definitions into the interface itself. We also need to communicate better with users during blue sky mode on what the model means and why it's important. And there's also some tweaks that we need to make. So I mentioned that alert site dashboard. Um, we really need to be incorporating um, that kind, those kinds of metrics into the model itself. So you may have a service that um, you know rolls up to a, an ORL too, you know, but if it suddenly starts crashing when there's a hurricane, um, that's no longer operational for us. And that's it. Thank you very much, Carrie. And uh, I'll note that uh, uh, if you have questions for Carrie, uh, we'll be handling them through the chat, right? Uh, Carrie, will you be able to hear us? I, um, yeah, I've got to drop off. Um, I've got some ice storm stuff I've got to <laughs> attend to. But if you just put them in the chat, I can address them um, there. So I'll be on the, the chat. chat. Yes. yes, thanks. Okay. All right. So uh, we have one more a speaker. Maggie Glasgow has been a very active uh, participant in the disasters cluster, a researcher at NASA JPL. Uh, she's the disasters coordinator at JPL for uh, the Earth Science Disasters Program. And she's worked uh, heavily with the state of California and the um, uh, California Earthquake uh, Clearinghouse Group. Uh, and I, I think that uh, her work is really dealing with some pretty sophisticated data products, uh, especially for uh, risk assessment and da damage assessment uh, kinds of applications, a very, very cutting edge and getting those new kinds of products uh, into the community that can use them. So um, Maggie, uh, let's Please, uh, please continue. Great. Th thank you, Karen. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, the support that NASA has um, provided to the state of California um, for the 2017 California wildfires and some lessons learned uh, from, from our experience. Um, and I'd like to say that um, I represent the, the disasters program on this, um, and we have a, a wide variety of um, uh, investigators um, and uh, flight programs that support the program and provide uh, data products and information to the responders that uh, we uh, then uh, 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 provide to the to the responders um, as as um, they are responding to the events and also um, in, during the recovery phase. Um, so uh, we've been working with the state of California for a number of years now, and um, as it happens, um, the California Earthquake Clearinghouse not only deals with earthquakes, but um, other um, uh, cascading events, uh, wild uh, fires being one of them. And so we've we've gotten in contact with a lot of our partners um, through the clearinghouse um, for wildfire events. Um, so a little bit of background on the disasters program. Uh, we provide value-added scientific uh, data products for response and recovery. Um, we target actually a spectrum of disasters, um, but I'm going to concentrate on the wildfire aspect for this um, case study. Um, we have a number of program coordinators across um, headquarters and the centers um, that help to um, enable product generation and delivery of these products um, during disaster activations. And this is where we as a program um, will um, uh, get together and um, help to support a, a, an event once we have identified an end user, since we are not an operational agency, we do have to wait um, until we have identified an end user in order to deliver our products. Uh, we are sharing these uh, 
products directly to the end user um, through um, direct emails. Um, also, they're posted to our disasters website and through our, our new G, uh, GIS geo portal. Um, next slide. So um, just a brief uh, overview of some of the products that we provided during the um, wildfires. Um, last year in October, um, we had these wildfires um, in California, and we have a, a decision support system called the NASA Recover um, Decision Support System, and they were able to rapidly um, provide GIS layers of Earth observation imagery to, um, to uh, firefighters and uh, managers. Um, and this actionable information was used um, to respond to these wildfires. Um, so this was um, provided within five minutes of fi um, the fire severity imagery um, being available. So this is just um, some uh, examples of the layers that were provided from the Recover program. Um, and the URL is, is listed right there on the, in the slide. Okay, next slide. Um, and we also have a variety of airborne assets that we're able to um, collect data and, um, uh, uh, sorry, satellite assets as well. Um, so we, we use a combination of satellite and airborne um, instruments to collect data over these um, events and be able to create um, uh, products for the decision makers. Um, so in December of 2017, we had another outbreak of wildfires that we supported, um, and we uh, provided scientific data, but it did uh, require additional processing, and this is something that I'll talk about in the lessons learned. Um, so this response um, provided a catalyst to improve our program's ability to translate um, the scientific data into more valuable um, geospatial information uh, while the disaster events were occurring so that we would be able to provide um, actionable information to decision makers. Next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned, we also have um, airborne um, data sensors that um, were able to collect um, information over these fires. We have UAVSAR, which is a L-band synthetic aperture um, radar instrument. Um, and it was able to map um, the areas that were um, affected by the um, wildfires up in Sonoma County. Um, and also we have a multispectral instrument, um, Avarice, that, um, were able to, that was able to um, collect data and show um, where the wildfire hotspots were and um, the, uh, the um, location of um, chemicals. Um, next slide. So as I mentioned, we have um, a geospatial portal that um, is delivering our data. Um, so this is um, in order to provide action-driven geospatial content and capabilities um, and support integration of um, our analytical collaboration across the um, disaster management landscape. So this is located at map.disasters.nasa.gov. And I'll mention that um, we are activated currently for the Southern and Northern California fires. And if you go to maps.disasters.nasa.gov, you'll see the products that we're generating currently for the wildfires um, that we're supporting um, right at this moment. Um, next slide, please. So this is an example of um, a data product that um, is presented within our geo, um, geo portal. This is a damaged proxy map um, of the Southern California wildfire. Um, this is a radar-based damage assessment um, that shows where um, likely damage has occurred in red and yellow pixels. And I just like to mention that we're trying to bridge the gap between the science community and the disaster community that can benefit from this pro these products by um, allowing the delivery of geospatial enabled data products through our GIS portal, not only posting these images and information to our website, but also allowing the uh, generation and delivery of these data products through GIS-enabled um, capabilities so that decision makers can bring these um, products directly into their decision support system. Next slide, please. So lessons learned from our, our work with the state of California. Um, we've, we've found that the end users are still confused about what products are actually available, so we've been working with them during downtime which we've had a little bit of, 
um, to uh, let them know what sort of modeling and remote sensing capabilities that we have and how to get those products ingested into their system. But we, we still need work to, to get this information and make the end users aware of them. Um, and we still need to understand their, their need for high resolution data and what the available versus what their needs are. Um, for this, this is not necessarily what is in NASA's wheelhouse, um, so we're trying to NASA products that are value added. Um, Hey Maggie, this is Dave. You're um, breaking up a little bit and uh, disappearing. Oh, sorry. I'm not sure you're moving a little. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, and we we also need to um, um, have training and engagement. So um, I think next slide is acknowledgments of my um, my colleagues. Maggie, I think we, we, we've lost your audio. Uh oh Can you hear me? Just barely. Okay. Uh, it must be my phone, but I, that, that was for me. Thank you very much. Yes. I, you did get down to the end. It didn't, didn't lose it until the very end there. So thank <laughs> okay, great. you very much. <laughs> um, all right, I think uh, we may be ready for uh, questions and answers now. If there's um, people have some comments, um, I will uh, take a look. There were a couple of comments that came up uh, earlier. Um, and let me find that one. I believe Phil Balin was asking um, Tom about uh, if you could comment on the national standards of data format utilities uh, that have been developed. For, uh, yeah, for some reason Karen, out. Karen, can you hear me, Karen? Yes, Tom, thanks. Yeah, <clears throat> um, the utilities, uh, like every organization, have standards for a piece of what they need. Uh, certainly, the weather data, they, they all have probably varying standards on that, but I think you know, it's, a, it's formatted properly, they can use it. The challenge with utilities is they have to get data in multiple formats in order to have a broader uh, aperture on situational awareness. For example, um, state declarations and waivers are critical for legal compliance for a utility truck to leave its state. If I'm a Maryland utility and I have been called through a mutual assistance request to go to Connecticut, the moment I leave Maryland, I am basically out of my operating territory. And if I'm stopped at a, at a, at a light in Connecticut and somebody hits me and I don't have a declaration on board that truck, I'm liable. So how do, these are PDF files, right? So the challenge facing the utilities is they have need for data that is in both GIS consumable format, but they also have need for data that is in PDF or text. There's a, there's a number of different um, forms data takes, could be JPEGs. So their specific need was to uh, decipher between all this information coming at them, uh, what can we use, as Carrie said, what can we use and digest within Duke to respond to Florence? Uh, and the preferable format is to have it in a specific, quickly consumable web-enabled service, okay? Uh, from my experience, only about half the data during a real-world disaster, only, only about half the data that we get is in that format. The rest of it is in spreadsheet or pick format or whatever. And this, this is where the opportunity is, is to, is to defer, define the standards that we need and work with those data sets we can get to pull in quickly. It's never going to be a 100% solution, Karen, as you know. It's going to be an 80% solution at best, but compared to today, it's better than nothing, right? So this is a work in progress. That's where I think this partnership is so important. 
uh, because as the utilities can work together with ESIP and so forth and come up with standards, uh, and more importantly, reliability standards like the ORL, that to me is what the utilities are really dying for. And apparently the federal government is dying for that as well. They do not have an ORL standard within DHS, and we're going to be working with them through the um, SICE working group to do just that, is to take this ORL approach and apply it into the DHS environment for, because they get far more data than we get. I hope that answers the question. Very good, thank you. Yeah, and I think there there was another question um, that um, I think uh, Margaret had regarding, uh, her question was to Dave about the hurricane cartoon drawn to scale. And to me, uh, this kind of gets to a deeper question, and that is the use of kind of standards in uh, icons and, and imagery. So Dave, I thought you might comment about the uh, imagery that you use, uh, especially say in tracking hurricanes, but uh, and, and the role of, of standards uh, uh, in, that, in that domain. Sure, that sounds great, Karen and uh, Marjorie. That's a that's a good question. Uh, the uh, storm as it Florence as it was approaching North Carolina, uh, there were a number of geospatial products that were displayed. One of them was the estimated time of tropical storm force winds arrival, and that takes into uh, into account the uncertainty of the cone uh, itself. And uh, so, the cone means uh, that's where it's most likely for the center of the storm uh, to move towards the coastline uh, within, uh, you know, make landfall within 65 miles anywhere within that cone. But the wind radii would extend out. So everything was to scale. It doesn't mean that the actual tropical storm force winds spread out over the entire United States uh, or the East Coast like that. But it was in the probabilities uh, and most likelihood of the storm taking any direction within that cone that's when tropical storm force winds would arrive. So the real importance of using these kind of standards for uh, data access and display are that the user doesn't have to worry about the scale because it's mapped into uh, everyone's mapping environment that they're using. So, um, so once the products are understood, and I think that we have to do uh, you know, the next job, uh, I think Maggie showed this as some lessons learned as well, but really educating people about the data sets they're getting. I mean, we're, we're seeing more and more agencies and organizations standing up web services and geospatial uh, formatted data. However, the users themselves are not subject matter experts on that data. So it's really important for organizations like All Hazards Consortium, ESA Federation, a Storm Center to some extent, when we go in and talk with, uh, with customers, one of the first things they ask us is, what does this data mean? How can we uh, make sense of it? How can we use it? And then that's why the ORL levels have become so, uh, you know, so interested. Uh, many have been so interested in the ORL levels because it's a trusted level, a trusted level of data. So they don't have to worry about where the data came from and all that stuff. They can put it to work uh, right then and there. But, but the simple uh, answer to Marjorie's question is yes, everything was to scale. Terrific. Uh, Dave, there was another question here for you. <clears throat> Are there plans for GeoCollaborate to provide additional services or to support uh, additional disaster responders? So the GeoCollaborate itself was developed to address any geospatial challenges that exist. So um, uh, yes, the ability to use GeoCollaborate to, uh, you know, we use the, the use case that was um, adopted by the ESA Federation under the test bed was this responding to disasters and the movement of fleet utility vehicles. However, um, GeoCollaborate can access and share any type of geospatial data, so it doesn't even have to be environmental uh, or disaster related. It can, uh, it can service any agency or organization you know, showing live movement of vehicles or position of troops or assets or things like that. Um, the hard nut that we cracked over the six year period of the SBIR was how can you access disparate data sets, share them across any platform and keep people on the same map at the same time so they can make decision making and make better decisions and improve their situational awareness. Yeah, hey Karen. 
Yeah. Uh, just a comment. I think what Dave said is really important, and I would, for our listeners uh, on the webinar or future, what we have learned is when this stuff comes into the real world, the ability to see multiple types of data give birth to derivative product, okay? We didn't realize that if you combine data set one, two, three visually, then people think, you know, if we had data set four, this would be altogether more valuable to my company or sector, right? Um, and we noticed within government, the same thing is um, the more you collaborate with data, the more it opens one's mind to other sets of data. And sometimes a data set by itself isn't as valuable as a collection of two or three. It just gives you a broader, higher fidelity of the situation than just a single data set. Does that make sense? So this collaborative nature uh, gives birth to better uses and kind of opens the aperture mentally for people to see the bigger picture than just flooding data or aerial data or stuff like that. Anyway, that's it. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Excellent point. And in fact, um, I had asked uh, Carrie, and, and people may have seen it on the chat, uh, when she mentioned that the, the new Veers flood data product couldn't be used because it would uh, introduce too much confusion at that point in real time. So I asked her what steps to take, and she said uh, that uh, she would show it to a select group of end users, and they have biweekly incident command meetings. Go over what the data set is showing, ask them if it would be valuable to add, and if it is, test it out first in the test bed, make sure it works the way they expect, and then add it to the production application, alerting users uh, of the new data set with the message. So she, they, have a, they have a process for doing that. And um, it occurred to me that at one of the all hazards meetings, uh, there was quite a focus on the, the role of training and preparation and uh, kind of the blue sky, you know, when everything is going fine, what kinds of activities are happening during blue sky? And I, I thought, Tom, uh, you, it'd be interesting if, if you could comment on that. I think uh, Maggie might have some insights about, uh, you know, how she does that since we, we have a couple yeah. more minutes. <laughs> yeah, Tra training if somebody uses a tool, buys a product or whatever, if they, the, the odds are very high if they are not trained on how to turn it on, how to load it, the, you know, the tactics, more importantly, the strategy, how to use it and what does this mean? The chances are almost 99% that they will not renew the usage of whatever that is. That's true across retail markets. That's true across data. It's, it's human nature. So what we've learned is the training is almost as important, probably more important in the first year than the actual data to, 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 to the average person. And the reason for that is, is in the decision-making world, uh, we are bringing new data sets to the table that they may not have seen before. And so for them to know the background, where it came from, how to use it, how we've looked to use it, but they might see a different use for that data uh, is really important. So the training is critical to this and it can be automated training, okay, via video. As you know, we do a lot of video training. It can be real-time training. Um, and many times what we're finding in the private sector, especially, is they don't, uh, they don't buy data. They buy training and they get the data for free. It's kind of funny, but that seems to be the model that we're seeing in the private sector. That's it. Thank you. Very interesting. Karen? Um, yes. This is Phil Balin with the California Earthquake Clearinghouse. I'm the IT lead. And I, I just wanted to both make a comment and give a shout out for the great work that Maggie and her colleagues have been doing with us. Is that even over this last weekend where we've had our uh, two sets of fires, Northern and Southern California, they were creating change detection data sets and pushing them out. And what was so meaningful this year is that they don't just push out the data, but if we give them comments about reformatting the data because it comes, it came originally in a KML format, an image format, not really useful for GIS analysis to see what critical infrastructure or people are in the way. 
they've converted the format to an actual GIS friendly format that we can now use. And then our process is to push it out. And it's only because, well, it's not only, but there's a very helpful uh, GIS analyst on the East Coast, Jeremy Kirkendall. I just wanted to point out that over the weekend, he was sending back and forth, you know, iterations of the data uh, to, to give us, to make sure that it was working for what we needed. And, and one last point is that although that we use a lot of your model data, one other aspect of getting feedback, kind of a two-way exchange of data, is your model, many modeling efforts need ground truth data, ex, uh, point data of the actual structures that are damaged. And that needs to be further developed. We're doing that right now, trying to send back to NASA team again to look at the change detection data they created, but to give them back where actual damage point, you know, structural damage has occurred, because then they can uh, modify, refine the data set. And, and this is just a general trend I'll point out that I think is very useful to consider, is as much as you create modeled information, there should be a two-way street of pushing back that actual ground truth of data almost in real time in a workflow where people know where to get that damage data, it's set up. So that's a good area for us to continue to work on. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. That's really an excellent point. And I think we are now out of time. So thank you, everyone. I'd like to turn it over to Erika to uh, close our, our webinar today. Thank you, Karen. And um, I'd like to thank all the presenters and particularly the Disaster Lifecycle Cluster for today's webinar. Um, it's been very interesting and very insightful to get a behind the scenes look at how information comes together to inform decisions that are made during disasters. Um, and I think most importantly, you all have highlighted, addressed and highlighted the important issue of trust and how confidence and in data information can be more easily and quickly assessed. Um, through the collaboration between different stakeholders. Um, that's a really important point to, to, to make. Um, and, um, and so if you'd like for all the, listen, the, um, the audience, if you'd like to stay connected to these issues, um, uh, please uh, connect with ESIP um, and also the disaster lifecycle. Um, and I'll also put up some of these links here. And I'd like to also, um, uh, highlight the um, participation of our collaborators, the GeoValue community. Um, and next, um, next slide. Um, and with that, I'd just like to, to thank everybody for attending and please join us for the next webinar on December 4th on the educational value of earth science data information applications. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.